simple song, but isn't it? It's a simple, simple song, but isn't it? Isn't it what captures us? You know, Jesus spoke of uh, coming to him like a child. And that's, a, that's the wonderful thing about childlike faith, isn't it? Now, you tell a child that Jesus loves them. You tell a child that Jesus died for them and it will break their little hearts, won't it? What do you mean? You tell, you tell that same child that Jesus came alive again for them. And there's great celebration in their hearts, isn't there? Because they don't struggle with it. They don't struggle with the, the you know, all the, 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 the complexities that we add to these things, right? You tell them that he died, he's alive again, and he's alive again because he's alive again, and you will you will always be you have hope, you have promise, you have, and you teach your children these basic, simple things, and it and it and it does, it captures their heart, and you ask a kid what he has done. You know, we sing that song and we go, and we do, we go to far-reaching places in our lives and what he's done and all that sort of stuff. You tell a little child, like, ask him what Jesus has done and that will tell you that he died and he rose again and he's going to take me to heaven. You know? The simplicity of the gospel, the richness of it, the power of it to, to, to lead us in life. Don't you love that scene? Yeah. Don't you love that scene when Jesus is sitting there and he takes a child and he sits him on his, you know, the, the wise disciples are there chasing the parents away and trying to chase the kids away. He's too busy. No, 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 no. No. We come to him as a child, don't we? And as a child, we know exactly what God has done for us. How are you? Good week. Uh, yeah. I've been asking people this morning, what was the week like? There's been some challenging weeks, you know. There has been some challenging weeks, but um, God's been with us every step of the way. Yeah. That's what I've been hearing. Well, let's open our Bibles. Um, if you are a visitor this morning, we are in the book of Ephesians. We're in the fifth chapter. I'd like to say we're on the home stretch. Nah. Yeah. So I'm glad we're not on the home stretch. Yeah. We're halfway through the fifth chapter. Let me just read the verses to you. Verse 15. See that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We've done half of that, haven't we? Already done. But what we're doing here as we go through this, in this passage we're continuing this theme, the theme of walking. You know, seven times in this chapter we have, uh, we have been challenged to walk and in a certain way. And the walk is to live in a certain way. It's to live as a child of God. And we are to walk as children of light. That's what we looked at last week, remember? In verse 8, walk as children of light. In the beginning of, this, of the fourth chapter, in a, in a manner that is worthy of the calling with which we have been called. And again in the fourth chapter, you know, we're told, yes, we walk in such a way, but not as the unbelieving world walks. And so constantly, over and over again, there is this exhortation to walk the right way as a child of God in this world and for a reason. 
I think it's important. I think it's really important for us to notice that Paul does spend or does focus so much attention on the walk, on spiritual growth as a believer. In, in again, in the fourth chapter, in verse 13, he spoke and said that we should be attaining to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. You know, God's desire, of course, is for us to become more like Christ in character, yes, in love, yes, and in service, more like Christ. For spiritual growth, it isn't just, it isn't just a personal endeavor. It, it is, it is an, it is, I don't know how to say this, but it is essential for us in realizing that there is a creative purpose of God. This is why we mature. This is why we grow. There is a creative purpose of God in all of us, and that is that we are to be His bearers, the image bearers of God to this world. So it isn't just gaining a theological understanding, even though that's what we do. You know? And it isn't just an exalted, an exalted spiritual awareness, even though that's what we attain. But it is so, so much more. It's all of that and so, so much more. It's a call to action, isn't it? This maturing, this growing. It's a call to action. It is God by His Spirit summoning us to engage us fully in this journey of faith. Can I say that again? Because I don't think you heard me. <laughs> it is God by His Spirit summoning us to engage fully in this journey of faith. Okay. You heard it, didn't you? Good, good, good. See, see I believe, you don't care what I believe. Of course you do. We do. <laughs> I'm pausing, I'm waiting, you know. Where you go? No, no. It's not about what I believe, it's about what God teaches us and shows us, of course, right? It is about what we believe. But there needs to be, this is where, I'm trying, I, want us, where I want us to start this morning. There needs to be in each of us an acknowledgement. And even that's the wrong word. No, no, it's, it, no. It's more than that. It's more than acknowledgement. There needs to be a realization within us. This is where I want you to start, where I want us to start. A realization within us of what is now the essential meaning of my being now that I am a child of God. Jesus Christ is not just my Savior, even though He gloriously is, right? He's not just my saviour, but his presence in my life is a growing dynamic that determines who and what I am and what I am becoming. It is deeply transformative. Deeply transformative. It is you and I laying a hold of God's intention for us to become vessels of his grace and love in a dark and broken world. And there needs to be a time in our life when that reality captures our heart. The realization, I mean, if you want to use an epiphany if you want. Yes, this is who I am. This is what's happening in my life. This is what God is doing. This is why I'm here. I am here. I am saved. I'm redeemed. I'm a saint of God. I'm set apart with this essential understanding and meaning of purpose. I'm a child of God. Yeah, he's not just my Savior. He again, he again is that and so much more. There's reason for me, be, me being here. I'm a vessel of His grace and His love in this dark and dying world. And it's a process. It's something that began. You see, I want us to, to start here. I want us to get this essential understanding because for so many Christians got saved and that was it. They 
that saved that was it. And that's where they stay. And they will go to glory and they will be in the presence of God and they will rejoice in the fullness of the joy that express well, they will because it's all of Christ and it's all of what he does. But do you know what I mean? Is, is there, is there, has there been a time in your life when you woke up to the reality that you're saved for a reason? <coughs> saved for a purpose? that is beyond you and the fulfillment of God's promise to you in glory. It's about now and it's about tomorrow and it's about the day after that. It's about every moment of my life. I just think there needs to be that in us. This is who I am. I used to be Christopher Wayne Fisher this person who was messing life up. I used to be this individual that was creating waves in this space that I exist that so often brought harm and hurt to people around me. I used to be, but no longer. No longer. The day came. And what a glorious day it was. And now I'm talking about every one of you. The day came, and what a glorious day it was when you lifted your heart to heaven and you saw a Savior that loves you, a Savior that put his hand upon your shoulder, upon your life, and promised to never take it off again, a Savior that said he will walk with you and he'll guide you through this life and he'll show you the way through, and all the way through he will use you to express his heart to everybody that you come into contact with every single day, every single moment you wake up like this. That's why I say it's important to understand and to recognize that Paul talks so, so much about this walk that we have, right? That we walk this walk that we have. Um, it's a call to action. God's Spirit, I'm going to say it again, summoning us to engage fully in this journey of faith. I believe, we, I believe every day can be an expression of that, that reality that has captured our hearts now. The previous verse, we saw it last week, verses that we have been made a light in this work. Not just, not just theologically minded believers that are sitting in the, amongst the darkness now. You know, our lives should be a beacon of, remember, of goodness and righteousness and truth, revealing the very substance of what it is to be acceptable to God. Think of your life like that. Do you, do you ever think of your life like that? When you get up and, you, and, you, and you're greeted by your family and, and your children gather around you and they look to you and you leave your house and you go to your workplace and, you, and, you're, and you're, you're engaging with people all day long and you're going to lunch and you're having breaks and you're going downtown and you're, and you're this and you're that and you're there and you're everywhere. Do you ever ever stop to think that that what you are in every one of those instances is the very substance or, or portraying what is or living or expressing what is the very substance of what is acceptable to the holy God. Again, there needs to be an intuitive grasping that this is the reality of who I am. And so this brings us to verse 15. He says, so, or see him. So have you got that? Did that make any sense? So see then, because that's who you are, see then that you walk circumspectly. That's my new King James. 
The ESV says, look carefully then how you walk. You might have an NIV and it says, be very careful then how you live. My my two my King James to New King James to walk circumspectly again. It simply means to be so carefully aware. It, it's it's a state of being. To be so carefully aware. The word means to look around yourself and to consider carefully. You see, we don't just go rampaging through life without thought of how our life impacts those people around us. We may have, that, may, that may have been who we were. I'm going to say it again. We don't just go rampaging through life without any thought of the impact that we are having on those lives that are around us. It's my life. It's my life, and I will live my life the way that I want to live my life. And nobody's here to tell me how to live my life. And if you don't like the way that I live my life, then you get out of the way of my life. Do you remember that? Because I'm free. I'm an individual. All of these sorts of things that used to be the substance of who we were. How shallow that is, right? Well, I'm a Christian. It's not your life. Does that hurt? No, it could. It's not your life. What about this? It doesn't belong to you. Does that hurt at all? No, that's good. It's not your life, and it doesn't belong to you. What does 1 Corinthians chapter 6 tell us? The Apostle Paul, I love it when he says, do you not know? You know, he said, you should know this. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have from God, and you are not your own? Verse 20, for you were brought with a price, an incredible price, right? Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are whose? God. In your body and your spirit, the totality of your being, your body and your spirit, it's all, it's all his. You are his. Remember back in verse chapter 2 and verse 8 where it says, For by grace we have been saved through faith, and not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus, what for? For good works, which who? Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God is involved, isn't he? God is involved, God is invested, God is, con is concerned about every single impact that my life, that your life has. He wants your choices. He wants your choices to align with who He is. And He has given you, as we saw last week, His light towards that purpose <laughs> that you might walk as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. And so He says, see then. Quite literally, quite literally, it is see to it. I had a Star Trek moment when I read that, but... You know the Star Trek moment? Make it so. Make it so, number one. Was that how it went? Remember that? Oh, I'm all alone on stage. You, know? <laughs> yeah. you got that? Yeah. Make it so. See, see to it that you walk circumspectly. How? Not as a fool, but as wise. So in verse 14, we read last time, we closed with where he said, And awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Look, it's so, I know it's so easy to become spiritually complacent. To lose the sight of why I'm actually here. You know? This is why I believe in the rapture of the church. Because I've always believed that if there was no reason for me to be here, you've heard me say this many times, 
If there's no purpose for me to be here, then it's the, and it would be a cruel joke for God to leave me here, hoping, you know, that one day, you know, the glory is going to, I'm going to be there. We sing about it every week. We're going to stand in his presence. And we're all saying we can't wait, right, until we're, until we're before his presence. We're all saying, oh, how glorious it's going to be. I think it would be a cruel joke if God left me here on this planet, struggling through this life and this world with all of these heathens around me who don't want to know him. That's a bad attitude, by the way. <laughs> if there was no purpose to me being here, and the God of love should have just raptured me the moment I gave my heart to him. And there is purpose to be here, isn't there? There is reason to be here. There really is, right? But it's easy to become complacent while we're here. To have a lack of awareness of his presence within our lives. And even an awareness of how he wants to or is leading us in this world. But again, we're reminded that his promise was to give us light. We're going to keep coming back to this. To give us light. You know? His promise is there. That light is to bring understanding. It's to, it's to bring guidance. It's to bring renewed purpose to this life. This, this sojourn that we have upon this planet. To become beacons of hope. To be examples of Christ's transformative power at work within our lives. Right? So we're not just here freelancing. We're not. We're not just making it up as we go along. We're not. But we, this is what the serpent speck walk is, we walk very carefully. What does Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12 says? It says that we are to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. There ain't no scope for freelancing there, is there? No, no. We're mindfully aware. We're mindfully aware of the surroundings and around us. We know what this world is all about. And we know the dangers and the consequences of foolish decisions. Because we've all made them, haven't we? We know it, right? So this is it. This is, this is what this walk is. It is a cautious, careful, well, there is a deliberateness about it. Cautious. Cautious, careful deliberateness in the way that we live our lives. That's, and that is determined by the essential meaning of why I am here. That's why I wanted us to start in that place this morning. This is what the circumspect life looks like. So he says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Okay, so nobody wants to be seen as one who walks as a fool, do they? So what then is the, wis what then is the wisdom of the circumspect living? Well, he goes on and says, verse 16 there, it's redeeming the time. Because the days are evil. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. See, redeeming the time is not gaining, it's not gaining time. It's not even getting time back. You know? You know, we say it all the time, well, where did the time go? We say it all the time, well, I'm just looking for more time, right? You know, don't we? I wish we had more time today. You know, none of us are going to be Marty McFly sitting in a DeLorean realising, hang on a minute, remember that scene? I've got all the time in the world, all the time I need. None of us, no, no. Every one of us, every single one of us, and excuse me for saying this, but every single one of us has exactly the same amount of time. 
Between the beginning of this day and the end of this day, every living person on this planet will have exactly the same 24 hours. No one gets a second more, no one gets a second less. There is no time to be gained and there is no time to be lost. There is just time spent. That's all it is, right? What we have is what we have. And the believer who walks circumspectly, as Paul says here, will live to make sure that it is spent in the wisest possible way. It's making the best of every single opportunity that God gives to us. Notice he says that, that redeeming the time, why? Because the days are evil. Again, what was that saying that, that I, I mentioned last week? Evil prospers. Why? Because good men are content to ignore it and do nothing about it. And that's so true, isn't it? So, so, left, left, so left to themselves, the days that is, left to themselves, yes, the days are evil. But if we are ready... If we understand why we're here, if we are ready to seize every opportunity to practice and express Christian love, then truly, you've got to believe this, then truly evil days can be redeemed for good. They can. So therefore, he says, do not be unwise, in verse 17, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So this is it. Do not be unwise. This word unwise that he uses here has the idea of, of, of a senseless folly. Senseless folly. You might say, Chris, you're sounding awfully serious today. Well, you're making our Christian life look awfully serious. Well, it is. It really, really is. Right? But I mean, you know, I'm I, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. Um, I'm not devoid of levity, right? You know, in my life. If you get to know me, I smile sometimes, don't I, Jared? You know, I'm, I like a joke. I mean, none of us. None of us should be so rigid that we can't crack a smile and have some fun. That's not what I'm talking about here. But, but senseless folly here. Is really, it's a reckless foolishness in our lives. It's a reckless foolishness. It's a waste of time. Waste of time. When I say reckless foolishness, I mean like, you know, like when we were 13. I picked an age and I thought we could all at least remember. Did I get, is it 13 on do? <laughs> I'm going with 13, because when we were 13, we did, we did some of the dumbest things without thinking about it. That's how I remember it, right? And I want to tell you why we did the dumbest things without thinking about it. Number one, because our brains didn't work. That's why. Because our brains were no good. They were still developing. The prefrontal cortex of our brain which is responsible for decision making and impulse control, it wasn't working properly when we were 13, right? See, that's why we didn't always think things through. Do you remember this? That's why our parents were always saying to us and shaking their heads and always saying, I can't believe you just did that. I can remember my dad actually saying to mum, did you see what he did this time? Can you believe it? Clear as a bell, I remember that. Struggling to understand what his problem was, right? No. We didn't think things through because our brain wasn't working properly. Number two, another reason is because of peer influence, right? We remember that, don't we? We just wanted to fit in because we thought we never had any friends. It amazes me. I mean, a 13 year old, one of the first things I discover is that they got no friends, no one cares about me. 
And so what do we do? I remember this. I remember being alone in this world or thinking I was. I had a street full of friends. I just didn't realise, you know. But what I wanted to do was to be accepted by the cool kids because they're the only friends worth having, weren't they, when you were 13 years old? You didn't want to seem to be one of the... Because mm. I think that's who I was, you know. But it's so what do we do? We did dumb things to impress the very kids that mum and dad said that we should have nothing to do with because those kids are always getting into mischief. Those kids are always getting into trouble, right? So we did dumb things because our prefrontal cortex wasn't working. We can't listen to our parents who were smarter than us. No. We needed friends. And another thing is that risk taking, right? When you were 13, risk taking. Oh, man. Is there any 13 year olds in the room? <laughs> oh, you're okay. <laughs> Your brain's working, that's fine. Huh? <laughs> now, risk taking was how we learned. You see, that's why we didn't listen to our parents, who, incidentally, by the way, had fully developed prefrontal cortex. Right? <laughs> now, we wouldn't listen to them. Because our brains weren't working, because we want to impress those kids that we shouldn't be hanging out with. No, we wouldn't listen. To, we wouldn't listen to our mum, who knew what would happen if we jumped off the shed using a beach towel as a parachute. We didn't. <laughs> we wouldn't listen, and so we just did it, and we broke our wrist. No, here it is. I'm taking too long. Because at 13. We had no brains, we had no friends, we had no idea, we had no life experience, we were emotionally intense, 13 year olds, right? No. We were impulsive, and we did a lot of dumb stuff, a lot of dumb stuff, but that's why we had parents, because they were there to guide us and to support us and to protect us so that we didn't Mind you, I still believe that if I had had a big enough towel, <laughs> things could have worked out very differently that day. I did. I couldn't, I couldn't sleep a sheet out of the house. No. 13 was amazing. It was an amazing age because we were meant to do dumb stuff. That's how we grew, that's how we matured, right? But the thing is, we're not 13 anymore in this room. We're not 13 anymore, and God says to us, do not be unwise. That means we can be wise. But understand what the will of the Lord is. You see, there's an implication in this exhortation. When he says, but understand, but understand, he's saying, give your mind, give your mind that fully functioning, fully developed prefrontal cortex that you now have, give that mind to understanding the will of God and the sense of the word that is used means to apprehend it. The sense of it is to grasp at it. To grasp at it. You say, what do you mean, Chris, to grasp that understanding? What do you mean? No, no, no. What I mean is, it takes effort. It takes effort. Have you ever, ever been, you see, we don't have them here, but you know, the, 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 what's that thing that goes around in the, the fed? Merry go round. Round context. Merry go round. Uh, I think it's an American thing where there's a ring or a hook or a thing. Have you ever seen that in those movies? I think you've got to try and grab the ring off the hook or put the ring on the hook or something like that as you go around, you know. It takes effort, doesn't it? You, you see this lining up and there's all this effort that, that's in place there, you know. Uh, that, that's the idea of grasping at. It takes effort, effort on our part. We are not passive in this relationship with God, is what I'm trying to say to you. We're not passive in this. Understanding the will of the Lord is not a mystical dumping that just happens in our brain. 
But I think some Christians think like that. That God's just going to dump it all in there one day and suddenly we're going to wake up and cry out, Hallelujah, I see the light. <laughs> and suddenly I'm on a mission from God. No, 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 it's not like that. There is effort required. God commands us to walk with wisdom. He wants us to make the most of, I'm repeating what he said, he wants us to make the most of every opportunity and not to be reckless or unwise in our lifestyle choices. Earlier in the chapter, you remember earlier in chapter chapter 5, we were, there was a list there of the things that should not even be named amongst us. Things that it says are not, that are not fitting for the saints of God. So God has given us His Word. He's given us prayer. He's given us His wisdom. He's given us His Spirit. And He expects His children to make godly, wise decisions. It takes effort. It takes effort. So what do we do? What's this effort? Well, we don't embrace the morality that this world is selling us to start with. We turn away from it. It's effort, isn't it? We turn away from it and we are continually moving towards the, mor the morality that is revealed to us through God's revelation of Himself, through His Word and through the revelation through His Son, Jesus Christ. Again, it's every day. This is why it's walking circumspectly. This is why it's being aware of what's around us, the world that is around us and what's happening, and being wise about it, being careful about it. Not reckless. Not without any care. This, see, this Christianity isn't left up to the so-called spiritual ones out there. It's all of us. It's all of us we choose this war. It's knowing what is going on around you and it's is considering carefully what your next step is going to be. Do you live your life like that? Considering carefully what your next step is going to be. Because a fool <coughs> lives completely unaware of this world and the course that it's on. Completely unaware. We need to be always watching. That's another scene. It's another kid's movie. Always watching. Sorry. But it's always watching and always ready to step into the purpose, the will of the Lord that God has for us. We call them divine appointments, don't we? We can hear on the Sunday night prayer meeting, I hear people pray these divine appointments. We have these wonderful prayer meetings and at the end of the door, it's generally in some sense of prayer, Lord, go before us, keep us, shine the light of your path upon us. Lord, give us those divine appointments. Give us eyes to see that we might step into them. No, that's the prayer. But the practicality of it is I'm always aware. I'm always watching. I'm always looking. You know, you've been, you've been sharing the gospel with that person week in and week out. Well, you stopped because they became so aggressive against you and you thought, okay, all right, I've got to step back from this thing. No more. And so now you're just loving them. Now you're just caring for them. And now that their lives are in a, is in a bit of strife and things aren't working out and the only comfort they're getting might be from something that you said to them 10 years ago. And 10 years, for 10 years, it's been sitting in the back of their mind. And all of a sudden, in the heaviness of this life situation, it springs to the front. And suddenly, suddenly you become the most important person. But now they know they've hated on you, and they've rejected you, and they've called you all sorts of names, and they've alienated themselves from you. And so now they know they're not going to be, they know you're not going to have anything to do with them. Why would you? They think. But a door opens up, an opportunity opens up, and the love of Christ in you for them that has never waned. Because you've always prayed for them, even when in the face of their rejection you prayed for them. And now the door opens up and you say, Yes, Jesus loves you. 
redeeming every moment and so wisely and with great clarity we invest our time in the things that truly, truly matter. How are we going for time? I'll finish quickly. Are you still with me? Verse 18 continues this thought and says, do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation. Your Bible might say debauchery. Debauchery, of course, is an overindulgence in many things. Certainly here, alcohol, sex, drugs, and so on. All of those things would be in the list. An overindulgence in ungodly things. So do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation but be filled with the Spirit. So the thought here is about being under an influence. And clearly we know those who get drunk are not making the most out of every opportunity, are they? We know that. We know they are making unwise decisions. Far worse than that, the drunk person is not only making unwise decisions, but the drunk person is making much, much more terrible grammar, but much, much more poorer decisions. Aren't they? And it's because they have put themselves under the wrong influence. And being under the wrong influence, the idea here is they live wasted, Thank you. unproductive lives. They are led astray from God's purpose for their lives, it clouds their judgment. It impairs their ability to make wise decisions and ultimately it distances them from God. But being filled with the Spirit of God, what is that? Well, that means to surrender ourselves entirely to the influence of the Holy Spirit. You see, it's an invitation to let the presence of God saturate out every, every aspect of our lives. We again, you know, we have access. You think about it. With the Spirit of God saturating our lives, we have access to the wisdom and the discernment and the fruit of the Spirit that Galatians chapter 5 talks about. We are empowered by the Spirit of God to live this life that we have according to the will of God, according to the purpose of God. We have power to love unconditionally, to walk in humility and to serve others with a heart, with a heart of Christ's compassion. The whole point here, that why Paul raises this here, is because that we, you and I, we decide what influences we come under, we put ourselves under. We walk circumspectly, wisely, aware of what's around us. We decide what influences affect our personality. We make that decision. Paul says, don't be under the influence of not just, well, not just wine, but any intoxicant that this world wants to, wants to inject into our lives. But rather be filled with the Spirit. I wrote this down last night. This is how the Spirit of God wants to influence your life. He's your guide and your teacher. He helps you to understand and apply God's Word to your life. He gives you insight into God's character, His will, and His plan for your life. He convicts you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He's the one who leads you to repentance. He helps you to recognize the absolute need of forgiveness within your life. He empowers you for Christian living. He provides the strength, the wisdom, and the discernment needed to navigate yourself through this world, the challenges of this life, to make right choices, to live a life that honors God. He produces the fruit of the Spirit, as Galatians 5 again tells us. You know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He, 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 he imparts that. He, he brings that into your being. 
And he gives you assurance of salvation and guarantees you a future inheritance with God. He reveals deep spiritual truths. He helps you to grasp some very profound things in relationship to the nature of God. Of God's plans and God's purposes. In essence, the Holy Spirit desire is to draw you into a closer relationship with God, to transform your life into Christ's image, and to empower you to fulfill God's purpose in your life and in this world, and through the Holy Spirit's ongoing work, that you might experience spiritual growth, intimacy with God, and a life that brings glory to your Creator. That's scratching the surface. That's the influence that the Holy Spirit wants to have in your life. Does anyone want that? All right. Now, do you want me to tell you about the influence that alcohol wants to have in your life? No. We know it, don't we? Christian, be filled with the Spirit of God. Walk with Him. Seek Him. Surrender to this. And it looks like, it kind of looks like what we did this morning. You know that? That's what verse 19 says. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Do you love that? I do. I try not to, oh, no, I don't try not to digress, I just do. But I, you know what, the, can, I give you the, can, I, can I give you the highlight of my week if you're interested? I do many services during the week. The one that just lifts my spirit more than anything is when I go up into the dementia-specific wing at Bethel Age Care. And I go up there, Ken comes with me, and we have a group of old people there who's pretty, you know, their brains are not always working, they're not always aware, and it's amazing. It's truly amazing, Ken, isn't it, what we see take place in that short hour that we are there. These are people, most of them, who had a relationship with God in their lives, but because of dementia, their cognitive ability often leaves them struggling to even know who they are and who anybody else is. And it's a sad and desperate thing to see. But you know, when we get there, and we talk about, keep it very simple, we talk about this love of God, and the, and the promise of God's presence. He's always with us. He never leaves us. He's always there. And we sing some of those old familiar hymns that they, listen, they heard their mother sing or they were little kids singing on their mother's knee. You know? And those hymns have always been with them. These hymns, these spiritual songs. And then the right hymn, we see them come to life. We see the power of it. It's what we are. It's what a spirit-filled being looks like. You know, we, we look at these people and think they're not even, they're not there anymore. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Yes, the shell is not what it used to be. The Spirit is there. The Spirit that was regenerated by the Spirit of God is there. And the Spirit of God is still at work within those people. It's amazing. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with melodies in your heart to the Lord. You know, some, For many of those people, they, oh, you know the story. They sit there, we, Ken and I, we walk in and they're sitting in their chairs and they're just, And we walk in, and everything changes. Mm -hmm. The Spirit of God is at work. 
But I share this story because you know how tragic it would be if we would live our lives thinking that Jesus is only our Savior. And that's where it stopped. And we just sit in the pew. We just go to work. And we just raise our family. And we just be like everybody else. Wouldn't it be tragic if we spent all of our lives like that to fall victims, if you will, to this thing called dementia? And for someone to come in and to speak the word of God and to sing his praises and all of a sudden that spirit that has been resident within us because all of our inhibitions are gone, all of our problems are gone, all of those resistances are gone, and all of a sudden the Spirit of God just springs forth and just bam! Bam's horrible, and that's not the way I wanted it. I was really looking for something more impactful. <laughs> Wouldn't it be tragic if, if it was, if the life was wasted? We haven't redeemed the time. You see, if you redeem the time, if you are so aware of what's going on around you, you know this world, you understand this world, but you understand it, you know God, and you know what God wants to do, and He gives you eyes to see, and when those doors, those opportunities open up, and you step into them, and God does something wonderful and amazing, you know what happens in your heart? Bam! Is what happens. You speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You make melody within your heart before the Lord. That's what life should be. That's what the spiritual life looks like. And you are giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Worshipful hearts, grateful hearts, spiritual life. Amen? Amen. You will do this, brothers and sisters. If you will daily spend time in prayer, if you will invite the Holy Spirit to guide you and empower you, if you will immerse yourself in the Word of God, if you will obey His command, if you will live in such a way that aligns your choices with His teachings, if you will continually surrender your desires, your ambitions, and your plans to God, if that's who you are, that's the circumspect walk. Amen? Father in heaven, we thank you and we praise you. I thank you for these precious people gathered here. I thank you for their, their hearts for you. I thank you for their love for one another. I thank you for all of what you have done. And I even thank you, Father, for the trials and the tribulations and the struggles, knowing that you are doing great things in all of our lives equipping us, perfecting us for the work of the ministry. We thank you for your word. Spirit of God, I just want to thank you for always being there. For always, always being there. Help us, Father, to recognize these things. Give us, give us again those eyes to see. And may we understand the greatness of every single moment because you are present because you have purpose because you have desires oh in Jesus name I thank you for these things Amen